So in the upper atmosphere, DSMC has several advantages when you compare it to other traditional modeling methods. Uh, for molecular dynamics, uh, we usually simulate a smaller region because it's, we, uh, we need to simulate a smaller number of particles. Fluid dynamics is not as effective in the upper atmosphere because the molecules are so far apart. Therefore, the gas does not behave as well as a fluid. So DSMC allows us to deal with this range in between molecular and fluid dynamics. We can simulate large amounts of particles in a large simulation range very effectively. In DSMC, we divide our simulation region into many different regions called cells. And each of these cells will contain particles that have both a velocity and a position vector. And these will define the particle trajectories. However, unlike other modeling methods, collisions are performed uh, based on cell position and relative velocities instead of whether the trajectories cross. So we, what we do is we apply collision probability equations to an entire cell and then from that we will be able to see diffusion and other density related effects. In DSMC there's something known as a Knudsen number which is the ratio between the mean free path and the representative length of our object. And this Knudsen number will determine how big our simulated object can be. For example, if we are looking at a lower density, or usually a lower altitude, we can use DSMC to simulate, but our object must be very small. Our cell size is also dependent on our mean free path. In our simulation, we set the cell size to one third of the mean free path to ensure accuracy. Finally, we can find this mean free path by dividing our average particle speed by the collision rate. To begin with, we set a thermal velocity to all our particles, and we set this given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution. In this distribution, we find that it's dependent on both the molar mass and temperature. And we do this so our uh, simulation will converge faster. So in order to see how many collisions we're going to perform per time step, we first need to see how many collisions we're going to attempt to perform. And this is given by the maximum number of collisions. In here, first we look at the maximum volume available for collision. In order to have a collision, we have a particle with a diameter d. And in order for collision to occur, the second particle must be, uh, have its center in a radius of 2d, as you can see from this picture. And then when we multiply this by v max times delta t, that's basically the maximum distance a particle can travel in one time step. This gives us the maximum collision volume. And if we divide this volume by the total volume in the cell, what we get is a rough probability of the collision. And finally, we multiply this by the maximum number of particle pairs, which is a uh, number of particles choose two. And that's given us this following equation where mc and this is the number of particle pairs, and this is our probability. So now we go through each one of these possible collisions, and we perform them if our relative velocity divided by Vmax is larger than a randomly distributed number z between 0 and 1. And this makes sense because particles with low relative velocity means that they're most likely traveling in the same direction and are unlikely to collide. On the other hand, with particles with high relative velocity, means that they're traveling in most likely in opposite directions and have a higher chance for collision. Now for two particles that do collide, we derive their post-collision velocities based on two physical properties that we use in our model, both the conservation of momentum and kinetic energy. So these two equations are the post-collision velocities, and therefore two particles that came in with velocity v1 and v2. And in here, we have the velocity at center of mass. And this is the uh, sum of all total momentum involved in the collision divided by the total mass involved in the collision. We also have a unit, uh, random unit sphere vector E, which gives us two random directions for particles after the collision. Now, when particles collide with a boundary, we do a different set of uh, equations. Uh, first, we have a no type of boundary known as specular boundaries. These boundaries are mostly reflective. So when a particle comes in, it, it will hit the boundary and it will bounce off. And we assume that V2 parallel, which is the parallel component of the particle velocity to the object, will, will remain unchanged from the collision. Our perpendicular component of velocity will change. And we, what we do is we flip the sign because it's bouncing back the other way. And we multiply by a constant gamma. 
Gamma represents the reflectivity of our object. For example, an object that's 70% reflective will have a gamma equal to 0.7. And our angle, theta 1 and theta 2, are obviously affected by the uh, two velocity components. And if gamma equals 1, which means the barrier is completely reflective, we have theta 2 equal to theta 1. The other type of boundary, known as accommodating, is slightly more realistic because in this we assume that the particle does not directly collide with the object. Instead, it collides with one of the many gas molecules that are covering the object. And what happens is a particle will uh, hit a gas molecule and it will bounce around and eventually it will do a complete energy transfer with the object. So therefore, what we do is we take the particle and V2 will have a magnitude that's given by the Boltzmann distribution for temperature T of the object. And we have a random direction. In our model, we use both specular and accommodating boundaries because they are both accurate in some areas. Specular boundaries are more accurate for when an object has been in space for a long time because it has been outgassed and there is no more, there is not uh, a layer of gas molecules that are surrounding the object. It has been found that uh, space shuttles returning from space are approximately 40% specular and 60% accommodating. So the first step we took to verify our model was we wanted to see if our Boltzmann distribution was uh, correct. And we simulated an open area with free gas flow. And then we sampled the particle velocities after a period of time and to see if they matched our Boltzmann distribution. As you can see, the blue line is our simulated data, and the red line is the exact numerical data. And as you can see, we have a very close fit, which means that our Boltzmann distribution is being correct. So the way we have our data structure set up is we have an array of cells, and each cell has space for certain molecules in it. And if there's a molecule that wants to move into a cell that doesn't have room for it, it will expand. And this way, we're conserving memory for cells that just in general won't have as many molecules, say they're inside the object. Um, when we um, assign our particles to cells, we use modular functions to assign them to the proper cell, and then we, put, we group them in this way. And um, we want our data to be physically grouped by cell because when we're calculating, we're going to be using data from molecules within the same cell. And so if we had to randomly find where those particles are stored in memory, it would take a lot longer. And so this way, we can take all of the particles within one cell and calculate them, and we're more likely not to have to go back to memory again. Um, when we perform molecule object collisions, we project the trajectory of the molecule. And if we find it intersects one of the boundaries we've set up, we go back to where the collision happened and pick the appropriate method for um, continue the next velocity. And say there was another um, barrier here, we would continue to do this process until we've completed the time step and the particle has moved for its entire time. Um, one of the hardest tests we apply to the program is called the box test. And this actually sounds really easy. You put all your molecules in a box that has specular boundaries with gamma 1, so it shouldn't lose any energy. And they, the molecules collide with each other and they collide with the box and nothing should happen. But um, this actually revealed a whole bunch of bugs, and we finally got everything out. <laughs> and we passed the box test with an energy variance of no more than one part in 10 to the 13th. So essentially, the computer was, was changing the velocities just a little bit when things collided. But that was just machine accuracy. It wasn't like the, the equations were wrong. Um, we also used the box test to first incorporate things like proper cell size and 